Hello world! This is Richard Carrier for Free Thought Blogs, bringing you FTB Conscience 2. It's now 7 p.m. Central or 7 p.m. Pacific time, my time. Uh, it's a whole different day in the Philippines right now, uh, and I'm here to introduce our next panel, Fighting for Free Thought in the Philippines, brought to you by the Filipino Free Thinkers. Uh, hosting this will be Red Tani, uh, founder and president of Filipino Free Thinkers, and joining him will be several officials of that organization: uh, the Filipino Free Thinkers Operations Director Christine Chan, uh, the Filipino Free Thinkers Reproductive Health Advocacy Director Kenneth Kang, Filipino Free Thinkers Website Editor in Chief Marguerite De Leon, and the Secularism Advocacy Director Pepe Bawagan, Filipino Free Thinkers Metro Manila South Chapter Director Jaji Tiyanko and Filipino Free Thinkers Science Advocacy Director, Pichar Desierda. Uh, they are all beaming in their live, uh, beaming in their feed live direct from the Philippines, uh, where I said, like I said, it's already tomorrow. If you want to ask them questions, they'll take questions all throughout. Uh, please join the Feringula chat room at tinyurl.com slash ftbcon and post your questions there, and I'll forward them on to them. And uh, here we go. Enjoy. Hello, everybody, and we are from the future. And if you would like us to ask us questions from the future, just let us know through the chat, and we will try our best to answer. But if it's for personal gain, we will not answer the question. So first of all, we will try to introduce you to the Philippines, because maybe a number of you aren't as familiar with our country. We were recently put on the map by a very, very strong typhoon. Um, you know it as Typhoon Haiyan. We call it Yolanda in these parts. And um, yeah, like, thank you to all of you who donated, who sent their support. To those of you who prayed, that's cool too. We, <laughs> we appreciate the sentiment. And um, yeah, that, that, we were the, the ones hit by that typhoon. And other than that, what, what could be something that, uh, that people are familiar with about the Philippines. Well, if you're fans of boxing, uh, you might know us from, you might know us as the country that's from Manny Pacquiao. Yeah, we spawned that guy, and another, a number of other champions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're also known for our uh, overseas Filipino workers. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to hospitals or uh, nursing homes, you probably uh, have met a Filipino nurse mm -hmm. or a caretaker. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And also, if you watch American Idol yeah. or any of the other uh, con uh, singing contest shows, mm. a number of the finalists are, you know, are, uh, are Filipino. Mm. So and Jessica Sanchez, 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 Sanchez was our recent one. And some people also like to claim, in fact, there is um, evidence for it, that the Philippines is one of the few predominantly Christian countries in these parts of China, especially yeah. in Southeast Asia. We are the last bastion of Catholicism, maybe now in the in the world. Mm -hmm. Malta used to be one of those places, mm -hmm. but they passed several laws, mm -hmm. like to the contrary, like they passed their divorce law, yeah. they have the reproductive health law, mm -hmm. but here in the Philippines we have neither, mm -hmm. and that's because of the, the strong influence of Catholicism in the Philippines. So. That's what we're going to talk about today. We'll start by giving you some of the history or the background of secularism in this country. So let's start. Um, we were under Spanish rule for like almost four decades. Yeah. Uh, centuries. 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 And because of that, Catholicism really became ingrained in our culture when we of course, the, our revolutionary heroes fought against the Spaniards and against that phrenocracy because before we even had our own constitution that, that, that was secular, we followed Fernando Real, the, the royal patronage, which dictated that the friars really controlled everything in society. So everything from schooling to government to even uh, private lives were influenced heavily by Catholicism. And our revolutionary heroes, maybe you're familiar with Jose Rizal, he's our most famous uh, national hero, he fought against those, the, that kind of influence. But when we finally freed ourselves and were trying to ratify our own constitution, 
like one of the, the guys who were fighting for secularism, his name was uh, Apollinario Mabini, he was so surprised that a lot of the people voted that we become a Catholic country, a Catholic state, and he was so surprised by that. Um, the voting went uh, tie, tie, and then he had to break the tie himself. The, the, um, Mabini broke the tie, he became a secular state, but we had to suspend that secularism because before we became an independent state, we came under the rule of the Americans. Yeah. So thank you for that. <laughs> for <Mary. Yeah. laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the Americans through the Treaty of Paris, I think they bought the, the Philippines from and Spain. yeah, from Spain. And the secularism was suspended because our thought that if there was separation of church and state, that would divide the country. That was by this time already very Catholic. So the first official business related to the separation of church and state was to suspend it. And that's, that really says a lot. And it really foreshadowed a lot of the problems that we would have in our country. So when we gained our independence finally, the U.S. had to negotiate a deal with the Vatican, I think it was William Howard Taft, who had to bought our had to buy our country from the Vatican, and that is why the Catholic Church in the Philippines is still very, very rich. Like they have around how how much is it now? Is it it was eighteen over eighteen? It was eighteen billion the last time somebody tried to count. But if you consider that all of that was in high value investments, because these guys. You know, don't, they don't play around. They're invested in big banks, in big uh, land. Mining. Mining. It used to be in mining, but people criticize that because a lot of like Catholic uh, priests are against mining. They took it out there and put it somewhere else. And the, the value of the assets of the Catholic Church is really unfathomable to the average citizen. They have uh, at least 18 billion. It's not really a stretch to say that they have over 20 billion right now, maybe even 30 billion. Possible. Yeah, it's possible, and that that you know they don't we don't see how they use that money. Mm -hmm. There's really no accountability. No In the same way that they they do not share with us where they they use their donations, mm -hmm. you know, with, uh, the, the church donations, we don't know where they use it. But anyway, fast forward to the present, and they are still a very influential force in Filipino society. And now we will talk about like that kind of situation. Like what is the secular situation in our country right now? Right now it's um, it's gotten to the point that the Catholic Church has become so powerful that it's um, some kind of lobbying force in both Senate and Congress where um, it's hard to pass laws that contradict Catholic doctrine. So, for example, um, in the past uh, year uh, or more, we've been fighting to have the reproductive health law um, to be, and this law would provide for um, uh, family family planning services, um, uh, giving uh, information, um, contraceptives to those uh, people who would uh, like to have it. So they would like to be educated about family planning. Um, the government will offer this. If they would like uh, receptives, the government will also offer this. And as you all know, the Catholic Church is partially against uh, contraception. And they find contraception to be pretty much the same as abortion. Right? Yeah, so, yeah. So it's note that the reproductive health law does not make abortion legal in the country. It still would be legal even with the reproductive health law um, enacted. But, you know, the Catholic people don't really see, it, see that, oh, 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 it's oh, it's not going to be, not going to be legalized. Oh, it's okay. Like, no, that doesn't happen. What they do is like, no, if you pass this law, you're going to push for blah, 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 and then blah, blah, blah. And then it doesn't matter. It's already abortion. So it's it's difficult to have a conversation in this country um, about the reproductive health law without one of the signs ending up um, in the corner where they're trying to justify all of their arguments with religious doctrine. So um, that's what it's become. Um, 
in, in our country, like we don't even have divorce because it's against uh, Catholic. Uh, but we do have what's this? We have specific laws. Which is funny. It's funny. We have specific laws that allow for um, different rules when it comes to Muslims. Right? Oh yeah, yeah. For example, um, we cannot have multiple wives. Is that the case? Yeah. Uh, we cannot have multiple wives if you're not a Muslim, but if you are, yeah. you're allowed. Yeah. So that's that's one breach of secularism right there, treating people of different religions in different ways. And it's 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 weird how um, like oh this is the rule for everyone else, but if you're not particularly a Muslim, then you have this uh, special law for you. So it's kind of like we have a binary system yeah. when it comes to laws. So laws for Catholics. Yeah. And for not yeah, for no. Catholics, yeah. and and also we have a like in our secularism, we have a phony kind of pluralism mm -hmm. where they try to show that there are four many different kinds of religions, but in practice it's really for many kinds of Christianity. Yeah, right. Like they, they have a ecumenical prayer they like to say, but the words are obviously very Christian. It's uh, all, always to a male. Yeah. Like father figure, and it's always a god that intervenes. It's not a pantheist or kind of yeah. kind of god, and yeah, that, that kind of pandering, that token secularism that we have, like it's we're just very fortunate that okay, we are, we are in a in a kind of theocracy, right? But it's not a very harmful one. It's like, not as harmful. As harmful be. as let's say Islamic. Yeah. Theocracies, or where Sharia law is implemented, mm -hmm. and there are honor killings, you know, and you can you can be sentenced to death for yes. a number of one of which is just yeah yeah we're not gonna get killed for doing this mm -hmm. yeah. yeah but let me let me emphasize something that you said earlier because um, the situation in the U.S. is quite different They're, they they had their Roe and Wade Roe yeah. versus Wade and they celebrated the anniversary for that last week I think or. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, they celebrated it last week. We haven't ha had our Roe versus Wade yet, so abortion is still illegal, and not only is it illegal, it's even in our constitution that it's illegal. Like they they anticipated that that would happen, yeah. so to to prevent any kind of foot in the door situation kind of happening, like the the framers of our constitution put the line there: the the life of the mother will be protected. As the I mean, I mean, the equal value as the life of the unborn yeah. child. So it, until there's a radical, I mean, a, a constitutional change, yeah. we can't even discuss abortion as a law. So, but the, the 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 people here are quite excited because they're already treating our uh, contraception as abortion. Yeah. So it kind of no difference to them. Like the there's a Thing here where they, they say that the life begins with the union of the sperm and the egg. So that's that's what we have to contend with in this country. So fast forward to 2009 when the Filipino free thinker started. So what kind of context were we dealing with? We were dealing with a with a population that wasn't aware of atheism at all. Like the, the misconceptions about atheism that they had. Like what? What were they? They thought that we were Satanists. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's very common. Like when you say that you're yeah. an atheist, um, some people think that you are a Satanist. That's one, which is pretty weird because you don't think there is a Satan. So others think that you're automatically immoral or that you have no moral. You you, you can't have a moral grounding, and therefore they expect you to be a, a really bad person. So they're even surprised that really you're an atheist, but you were so nice to me last time. Or you're, you're such a nice guy, perhaps not an atheist. As a matter of fact, Red experiences personally. Like Red is a really nice guy, and when he said to to a bunch of people that he was an atheist, they, they were denying. Like, no, that guy was not an atheist. He was nice. So, so let me tell the story about that a bit. Okay. Like the. the at this point, the Filipino free thinkers was already established. We were already part of the reproductive health advocacy. We were fighting for women's rights, 
for LGBT rights, for freedom of expression, for secularism. And I'd already been on television shows talking about this, these issues, but I've never yet talked about atheism, mm -hmm. like in such a in such a channel, in such a forum. Mm -hmm. So I was invited to a very popular, maybe the most popular uh, talk show, yeah. um, serious talk show um, in the country. Uh, the name of the show was Bottom Line with Boya Bunda. And I was invited to talk about atheism. Mm -hmm. So that was very, that was a lot of pressure for me because, you know, I know that people will generalize. They will think that most atheists are like me, even though, you know, of course that's not the case. We're all a, we're a diverse group. But when I talked about atheism, people were just astonished that I was so normal. I was like so many other people. I, I wasn't a murderer. I followed laws. And people were saying, like you said, no, you're not an atheist. You're, you're probably hiding your Catholicism or something like that. So it just shows that you know people have a very low bar when it comes to non-believers in general. And it's very easy to surpass that. So just admit that you're a non-believer, and automatically you raise the level yeah. <laughs> of, of awareness and the just, impression. Just, just like being a decent person. Yeah. Well, <laughs> pose with a puppy. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. We, of course, mm -hmm. are not all atheists in our group. We are very progressive when, we come, when it comes to our beliefs on religion and on, on social issues, but you're not all atheists. Mm -hmm. We have uh, agnostics mm -hmm. and deists, and even Catholics and Muslims and Hindus and New Agers. Mm -hmm. And I, I suppose people who believe in aliens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, or people with weird beliefs. What we focus on in our group is the way of conversing mm -hmm. and thinking, you know. And uh, yeah, and those openness to, to discussing these beliefs to, um, for example, the, the fact that you do not rely on dogma and authority to protect your beliefs, but rather that if you have beliefs, you can put them out in the open and you're willing for other members of the group to criticize your belief if they think it will be as well. So what have we brought into the, the discourse? Because we are, like, like I've already mentioned, I think, activists and advocates as well that we, we of course started just as a as a community of free thinkers but we we somehow became like advocates for women's rights and LGBT rights and let me use LGBT rights in particular to give you an example of the kind of of angle that we bring into the discourse so I was in a meeting to plan for for the reaction that the LGBT community would have, or a number of LGBT advocates would have, to, the, to this particular issue. They, they were running for a position in Congress as a party list that represented LGBT individuals in Philippine society. And they were denied by the COMELEC's uh, second division. Yeah, Commission on Elections, they were denied because apparently LGBT individuals are a threat to the youth, mm -hmm. and to prove that, the, the Comelec used the Bible, yeah, the Bible, and the Quran, and they were saying, we're not being theocratic here, we're mo using more than one religious book. So the more religious books you use, the, apparently, the less theocratic you are. And okay, so I was in this meeting with other LGBT advocates and activists, and they were planning their strategy. And the conversation, the early conversation that I heard when I was there was kind of like this. It's wrong. LGBT individuals are not a threat to, to the youth. And that's according to the Bible. Like, Jesus never said anything wrong about the LGBT uh, society or LGBT practices. He was very silent on it. And God is a God of love, and He wouldn't uh, condemn any anyone for for who they love. That kind of situation, and, and I, you know, I, I was surprised by this, and I was waiting for someone else to raise the argument of, "Hey guys, secularism says hello," <laughs> but not, not, none of that. So I was very new to the scene, and I had to raise it myself. I raised my hand. I said, "Guys, if we fight this religious battle, 
there will be no end to it. Yeah. And why would you want to fight on their turf? That's their territory. They will beat you every single day of the year because we are still a predominantly Catholic country and no matter how progressive you'd want to be, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church is still in power in this country. So the best argument that we can make is secularism. Separation of church and state, you shouldn't even be arguing from religious books. Yes. And you know that, that kind of that kind of thing is what we would be saying in all of these other meetings in whatever issue. On the reproductive health issue, we would remind people that that uh, no matter what the Bible says or the Vatican says about when life begins or, or you know contraception being inherently evil, those arguments shouldn't even matter. Because if you're living in a in a secular state, uh, secular arguments made in public, I mean arguments made in public uh, more so in legislation should remain secular. So that's what we say again and again. And when it comes to the reproductive health law, the the Catholic Church is like the elephant in the room. You know, let me explain that a bit. Everybody knew that they were the major hindrance to the passage of the reproductive health law. For how long were they in this? Like yeah. almost two decades. Yeah, now. almost two decades. Almost two decades now. That's how powerful. They are. Yeah, so that's how powerful they are. They bring people would be filing a reproductive health law. Initially, it was a population development law, you know, a population angle. But when when people noticed how wrong that could be, you know, population control and the implications of that, like people focused on the rights perspective, yeah. on a, from a rights-based perspective. Individuals had the right to determine how they would um, raise their families mm -hmm. and how many children have, or whether to have children at all. Mm -hmm. so, about the elephant. so the Catholic Church was the elephant in the room because people were very wary of criticizing them. And why was this? Because the Catholic Church had their foot in everything. Mm -hmm. Right? They they were in agrarian reform. They were helping the poor and in so many other ways. Mm. And these advocates, being advocates for those other issues as well, mm. didn't want to lose the support of this huge organization, you know? Mm. So the situation would be like this. If I um, go against the Catholic Church or become very vocal on my criticism of the Catholic Church, then the Catholic Church might stop helping these poor communities that I'm working with. So, you know, that's mm. the kind of situation. And people were you know, silencing themselves. Of course, there were people who were vocal about the criticism of the Catholic Church, but they would always hold back. Mm. You know, uh, it wasn't a no holds barred kind of criticism, and that's what we brought to it. We we had no qualms whatsoever mm. about offending the religious feelings of the Catholic Church, and that's precisely what we did. Let, let's fast forward a bit to the the Carlos Aldrin incident. I mean, you, Marge, do you want to tell us about the, the Carlos Eljan incident? Um, okay, so uh, Carlos Eljan, he's a tour guide. Yeah, sorry. He's a pretty famous tour guide in Manila. Um, he's a really outspoken fellow. Um, and he's also part of a group that uh, was for the RH bill. It was still a bill at the time. Um, and basically, he found out that in Manila Cathedral, in his place, in his house, um, there was an ecumenical service mm -hmm. of sorts, um, and at the time he decided, "Hey, I, I, I think I should protest about um, the churches meddling with the RH." Let me, uh, let me, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, add some, context, add some yeah. context to that. So we were actually planning for a protest that would happen on a Friday. The next day. Um, it was Wednesday, so it was in two days, yeah. right? We were planning for a protest on Friday, and we would go in front of the headquarters of the Catholic hierarchy here in the, in the country. And we, we planned to go in costume. Carlos is a very flamboyant individual, and he likes going in costume. And the costume that he found was a costume of our national hero, Jose Rizal. And he found that costume on Thursday, the following day. And he put it on, and he was so excited that he wanted to to take a profile picture of himself wearing that costume. And what better background 
um, to use than, than Manila, one of the most famous churches or cathedrals in our country. So he went there and he was surprised to find that there was a, an ecumenical meeting going on. Protestants and Catholics and other Christian denominations were inside the church talking about this one Bible thing. And at this point, he didn't know that there was an ecumenical meeting going on. He just saw some people there. So he went in, as he usually does, you know, he went in and tried to have his picture taken, and he was just surprised to find so many prominent individuals mm -hmm. in attendance. The mayor, of Manila was there. the mayor of Manila was there. And, okay, you, you can take it from here. Yeah. Okay, so um, he got the idea that, hey, this is the perfect time to protest. Is that right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, he had a little whiteboard with him, and he wrote the word Damaso on it. Um, now, to give you some context, Damaso is a character in a novel. Um, he's a really evil friar, um, so uh, who like to oppress um, the townsfolk um, in that novel. So uh, he went up to the front of the, to, up to the altar, and just displayed Damaso to everyone who was sitting um, in the pews. And he started saying, "Don't, um, don't meddle with." Politics. politics. Mm. The Catholic Church should have meddled with politics. Mm. Um, and because the mayor of Manila was there and a lot of other prominent people, he got arrested. Um, and yeah, he, uh, in a few hours he was behind bars. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay let, let me explain the, the charge. The you know, for, for things like this, you would usually use a charge called Unjust vexation. Mm -hmm. That's the catch-all for, for things like this. You know, when you when you barge into an ongoing thing and you disrupt them, the charge is usually unjust vexation, and it's it's a couple of uh, bucks, you know, in, in dollars, and you don't you don't really get put in prison for so long or for or even put in prison. You just you pay the fine, right? But for this particular case, they found an archaic law. And yeah, this is it's called the offending religious feelings yeah. thing, where uh, if you're at a religious uh, event. event and you do something that is that would be considered offensive, notoriously offensive, that's the wording that they use. yeah, notoriously offensive to the religious feelings of those who are attending, then that thing could land you in jail. Yeah, and it happened. And it happened to Carlos. And it's the first time that someone really stood up in the Catholic Church in such a such an in-your-face way, <laughs> yeah. and it sparked uh, that nationwide debate on the position of, of religion in Philippine society. And you know, you would think that in a predominantly Catholic country, most people would be condemning this guy. Yeah. But that was not the case. A lot of people actually came out in support of what Carlos Celdran did. And we were already part of the same movement, like we, he was our ally, we were supposed to be in the same protest on that Friday, Friday. on Friday. So, so it was kind of convenient, you know, of course, whenever a friend of yours is put in jail, it's never convenient. But for us, you know, we, we already kind of prepared ourselves for a protest. So we, we went anyway on that, on, on Thursday, we, we, we started the, uh, to, uh, to go to, we went there on Thursday night. We visited him, him in prison, and the following Friday we went in huge numbers. It was actually the first uh, protest, uh, the first demonstration that the Filipino people led. So we had, you know, signs, signs like um, abstinence makes the church go, grow fonder. <laughs> Something like that, right? Yeah. Keep your rosaries out of your our ovaries. Yeah, stuff like that. And of course, three cardinals and that. So we had the science, and it was very new to us, but kind of, you know, it was fun. Like we were out there, and we felt that we were having our voices heard because the news people were there, the media was there, and we we went, we marched in front of the the headquarters, headquarters of the CBCP, the Catholic, the Catholic, Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines. And somebody went out to talk to us, his name was Monsignor Pecura. Mm -hmm. And that was the first kind of 
creative process that we did was Edgar Ilaga, like he had this sign, Edgar is another member of our group, he had this sign that said, citation needed. Mm -hmm. And for the geeks in the audience, you, you're familiar with that XKCD comic where at a political uh, event, like someone in the audience holds up a sign that says citation needed, right? So what, what Edgar and I did, we stood behind the, the, the representative of the Catholic Church and we held up the sign that said citation needed over his head. And the, the news, uh, I, I don't know if they, they intended this, but the cameraman of one of the major newspapers in the country, the Inquirer, took a photo of that. You know, my face was there, <laughs> I think you needed put it on. And it got on the front page of the Inquirer. And it was also on the front page of their website. And soon enough, like uh, it became viral online. It spread on online because, thanks to Boing Boing, uh, Boing Boing no less, you know, uh, Cory Doctorow's site. And the, it spread. And, and that put us on, on, on the map for a number of people here in our country, geeks, uh, secularists, and they, they wanted to join, they wanted to help out, and, and they did. And that's, that's when, our, when our group really started to, to become more proactive. proactive. Yeah, we, we would lead other um, creative protests. Um, what are the notable protests that we have done? Um, I think one of the other notable protests um, are the uh, Pachero bishops. Mm -hmm. um, there was this. Uh, uh, can you explain? Yeah, the controversy was that um, the former president of the Philippines um, used money from the government, was giving gifts to bishops, um, using taxpayers. Yeah, money. using taxpayers' money, and that he was she was essentially buying support. So to speak, and um, of course, this was an outrage. This was a, vi a violation of secularism. Um, so what we ended up doing was that we uh, oh the gifts were uh, SUVs. SUVs. So what we did was okay, why don't we dress up as bishops and we had these little um, Card cardboard SUVs that we wore on our shoulders as if we were in the SUVs. So we, there were like, how many of us? Like seven. There were seven of us, seven bishops with seven tiny SUVs. And then we walked to the front of the Senate building. Yeah. And then we held our protest there. Because mm -hmm. the um, yeah. on that day, there was a Blue Ribbon, Senate Blue Ribbon Committee um, hearing on, the, on this issue. So the senators invited several bishops to, to talk about like what what happened, right? And we were outside. We were wearing these these costumes. We were very accurate about it. There were seven seven bishops, seven vehicles, and we made sure that the the vehicles we were wearing were accurate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We made them all white though, because we assumed that they would choose the color white. Uh, <laughs> but but the make of the vehicles were were very accurate, and we were happy about that. Again, we we got on the news because of that. We got it on the cover of several. Uh, newspapers and tabloids because of that, but we were very disappointed because we found out that what was happening inside really was something that any secularist would be disappointed about. They were apologizing. Yeah. The senators were they apologizing to the bishops. There was, there, it was actually like a moment of congratulating the bishops, thanking them for all they're doing for Philippine society. And not investigating. The Senate Blue Ribbon was supposed to meet to investigate yeah. the issue, to check what was going on, the fishing business that was going yeah. on. But none of that happened. Yeah, it was a very token kind of Yeah, it was a very token kind of message. But anyway, somebody who wasn't as respectful of the bishops discovered, like from investigating, that they didn't actually receive SUVs, you know, per se. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't a gift of SUVs. What was given to the bishops were checks for SUVs, and the amounts were yeah. were made known. Yeah. And so, so we we're very, you know, we're a stickler for accuracy yeah. and details like this. So we did another protest this time with with big checks showing the actual amounts and the names of the bishops involved. Yeah, and, and uh, what we had, what we did was, um, so bishops. Seven bishops held these checks, and then the checks had uh, ropes on them, 
and then the ropes were all held by uh, someone playing the president, the former president of the Philippines. So she was holding these ropes symbolizing um, the power that she had over these bishops and how she wielded from issuing these checks to the bishop. And we walked the streets of Manila. And again, that got, got us on the news, like on the, and it brought attention to the issue, but you know, it was nice that it was us. Mm. But, oh, here, we, we actually have one of the checks here. <laughs> so that's how it looks like. And that's the Philippine Charity Stakes Office. That's the amount, that's the signature of uh, the former president right there. So thank you. It's nice that we still have these things. Well, we, double still side have, of we still have one book of journeys. I'd like to fast forward to this year. Um, one of the bishops who are accused of uh, the SUV thing um, is being promoted to Archbishop, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, uh, Bishop Quevedo. Um, and the thing is, when the news came out in the media, everyone was like really excited for him and happy for him. And people completely forgot that he was one of the bishops who was and accused. Yeah. 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 There's something about this country, it's a, it's a flavor of the moment, you know, flavor of the month kind of thing, where whenever there's something new and, and popular in the news, people forget everything that came before that. So yeah. I, I want to you know, go back some a bit. Because after that Carlos Eldran Damaso issue, we actually did a nice protest after that. So what we did was, you know, after that, like just to review, after that that uh, tour guide came into the church and with that sign saying Damaso and he was arrested and, and we did that protest. The, the following month we we went back there, right? Like uh, and we were with community women. Catholics, you know, because we work with Catholics a lot. Uh, of course, when it comes to advocacy, and most of the people around you are, are mm -hmm. Catholic, you have to work with, with people from different belief systems and all that. So we worked with, with a community of Catholic women, mm -hmm. and we went into the Manila Cathedral wearing t-shirts that said Damaso mm -hmm. on them, right? Mm -hmm. The same sign that Carlos Eldran held. And we weren't allowed to go inside, right? It was a it was a mass. It was a discernment mass, so that people would know the right way to react to the RH issue. And of course, they were just going to tell people to be against it. <laughs> but sure, they, they, let's let them have their pretense of you know, objectivity, or you know. So we went there. We tried to get inside because we were interested. What are the, what are they done these people? But on account of the shirts we were wearing that said Damaso, like we weren't allowed to go inside. We were asked to wait at the steps, and after the mass, they would finally let us in. You know. So what happened? Uh, we we waited on the steps. When suddenly we were waiting on the steps, when suddenly the president of Pro Life Philippines at that time. He barged out of the place and, you know, confronted the people at the steps and one thing led to another and then he started to perform an exorcism. <laughs> so he was saying, you know, in front of all of these women who were Catholics, mm -hmm. you know, they were free thinkers, sure, atheists, agnostics, but most of the, the women there were Catholics. Mm -hmm. And he was telling the group, Satan, get out, Satan, get out, like he was actually trying to cast all demons, not just demons, Satan, from the bodies of the people there. And it was a very weird, surreal experience. If you're interested, there's a video of that online. What are the, someone even screaming that you are not being happy? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was the same incident. Was it the president himself? The president himself. Of Catholic women. Because, yeah, one of the women was already on the verge of tears. I mean, some were even crying at, at this time. He, he, she told the president, I'm a Catholic, but, and then the, the, in response, the pro-life president said, but you're pro-RH, how can you be Catholic? Mm. You're, you're, you're an oxymoron. Mm. Those were his words, mm. you know, you're an oxymoron. Mm. Like there, there is no such thing as a pro-RH, pro-contraception mm. Catholic. Mm. Another, another memorable quote was, yeah, uh, they, they, they said that, uh, your mother should have aborted you. Oh, yeah. oh yes. We have that on video as well. So, 
what happened was, okay, we were already leaving, like the, the, the group, the Filipino printmakers group, that women's group, the SWP, they were already leaving in a group. And, you know, to maybe to add salt to the wounds, like those, those people shouted, your mother should have aborted you. Is this from the mouth of Prolan? <laughs> Somebody even corrected, you should have asked your mother to have aborted you. So he was, you know, the progressive tenses. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know, the, the grammar Nazi in that. Anyway, so, so that's the situation in the Philippines. And, and we would be doing events like this, creative and very in-your-face uh, protests to, to bring attention to this problem. I, I remember, like, during an HIV AIDS uh, convention, um, sponsored by the Department of Health. I, I, I attended, and there were all of these notable speakers from the Philippines, some from, from Asia, like I think it was a Malaysian who was uh, in attendance, and they were speaking about the issue of how to deal with HIV and AIDS, right? And I was surprised because we were already several hours in, and nobody mentioned the opposition of the Catholic Church to the reproductive health law. That would directly solve a lot of the issues that contribute to this problem, right? So I spoke and I said, like, you can discuss all you want, you can do all that you want, but until you address the elephant in the room, the Catholic Church, this big institution that keeps trying to block progress on this issue, then we will make no, no real progress. <coughs> and I asked the panel, and I, and, and I asked the panel this question, like, how do you intend to deal with the Catholic Church? Mm -hmm. And the only answer that I got from all of this, this, this panel of experts was, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> and then they went to break and didn't answer my question. During the break, a number of people approached me, shake my hand, thank you for asking that question. It's as if they've been at this, these events for so long, but nobody called out the elephant in the room. And I would find out the reason. Like uh, several minutes later, uh, a bishop, uh, Bishop Iniguez, would arrive. So they were expecting a bishop to be at the event. There was a table of Catholic leaders there, and they didn't want to offend these respected leaders. And that's the kind of situation that we have in this country. So. Where are we now? When it comes to the the, the contraception law, uh, the reproductive health law, it's not just a, a law that provides free contraception, by the way. As you mentioned, there's there's information on family planning. There's sex education. education. And just making the facilities that we have, the hospitals, you know, training of midwives, mm -hmm. just better so that um, fewer deaths will happen. It's a, it's a common saying already in, within our circles that, that 15 women die each day because of maternal um, you know, pregnancy related deaths. And a lot of those deaths could be prevented, majority of those deaths could be prevented if we had a, a, a reproductive health law. Okay? Finally, after 14 years or you know almost two, two decades, because sometimes people add the, the time span, it wasn't an RH law, it was a population time law. So anyway, after almost two decades of fighting for it, we finally passed the Reproductive Health Bill. It became a Reproductive Health Law. But soon after that, constitutionality was questioned, and they're now discussing it in the Supreme Court. And just recently, just yesterday, we got very bad news. Um, yeah, um, that word has it that half of the uh, uh, judges in the Supreme Court um, will be staunchly, staunchly against the passage of uh, the implementation of the law. Um, so we don't know yet what actions to take regard, regarding this, um, but it looks like we have our work cut out for us again. Again, and yeah, it's, it will really be a huge blow to the reproductive health and secularism movement if the Supreme Court declares the RH law unconstitutional. It will set a bad precedent for the other progressive laws that we still want to have passed, like the laws on divorce, on abortion, on euthanasia, you know, stuff like that. We can't even bring to the table to discuss if 
we, we don't have that RH victory first because people are focusing all of their energies on that first. So I, I want to so now that uh, now that people like, like our audience has an idea of the kind of things that we do, like I, I want to contextualize like what are the similarities and differences that we could have with the free thought movement in the US and in other countries world. Right? Because um because free thought in the Philippines, it wouldn't have happened if if it hadn't started in in the U.S., you know, when when new atheism became a thing, you know, new atheism with people like Sarius and uh, Richard Dawkins, Hitchens and Lennon writing their books, like those are the same books that reached our country, and people started mailing lists and online groups because of these books, and those those groups would eventually become the, you know the core of of Filipino freethinkers. So we owe, you know, like our secularism, our, our free thought to, to these writers abroad. And I just want to talk about what we have in common um, from our perspective with these communities in, in the states. Like, um, like who inspires you? Who inspired you? Then let's talk about who inspired you in those communities. Well, yeah, actually, one of the persons who inspired me would be uh, I was reading when I was in college. Books written by Carl Sagan on science and the romance of science. And what really got me into atheism, because I was already starting to lose my faith then, but I was a deist sort of that thing. What really got me vocal into atheism was Richard Carrier's books. Richard Carrier? Yes, Richard you mean, Carrier. You mean these, yes, books. these books, yes. These books and um, the yeah, yeah. Down his website. <laughs> these books. These books, especially Sense and Goodness Without God. Because there was really a time when I was philosophically lost, I couldn't justify religion and belief to myself. But I had this, because it was, uh, I, I was convinced from childhood yeah. that morality is based on religion and religion alone. And without belief in God, everything is possible. You could do everything. And so I, I was raised with that mentality. And even when I was losing, as I was losing my faith, I still subscribe to that. So I thought that I was going to lose my faith. I couldn't justify it to myself. Therefore, I couldn't have any morality. And when I read Richard Carey's defense of a godless morality, of a morality not based on religion, then I said, wow, this is really great. I, I, that encouraged me to read more on atheism. That made me search the internet. And that made me discover the, the mailing lists of atheists and free thinkers and agnostics here in the Philippines. Great. Uh, what about you guys? Um, well, for me, um, I've always been a skeptic. I've always been um, pretty much a doubter. <laughs> um, but I was quite lazy. Like, I didn't really bother to research on anything. Um, but then, just about five years ago, uh, I, I came across uh, The God Illusion by Richard Dawkins. Um, and I really didn't know anything about the free thought movement, or I, I, I had no idea that these things existed. Um, but when I read the book, it so concretely explained everything that I was thinking too, um, and that made me realize that hey, I should actually like read up more. Um, so I also read uh, the stuff you guys read, um, and then I found the Filipino free thinkers through um, their radio because I heard Red Whoa. talking about talking about uh, priests in uh, not. Pleasant life, <laughs> um, and yeah. So um, it was really important to get a little kick because there are so many people who actually think the same way we do, but um, it's just not concretized. Um, so uh, it's really important to get that little reading going. For me, like um, because I, I never was a huge reader of these uh, philosophical books. What 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 really changed my mind or uh, on many things was watching videos um, especially those by um, YouTube channels Kuali Asuk mm -hmm. and Terra Ventries I think they're brothers and um, the videos that they make are very uh, are very interesting animated and very they're excellent explanations of uh, like supernaturalism dualism uh, atheism morality without gods and so on so they they changed my mind on many things, and that's 
that's one of the powers of the internet. Like videos really help me. Well, on my part, like I started with books by you know Bertrand Russell and uh, the the oration of um, Robert Greene Ingersoll, but for you know recently. It was the work of Dan Barker of the Freedom from Religion Foundation that really inspired me to do a lot of the things that I'm I'm doing now with the with the free thinkers, and it's actually the way I came out to my extended family because my immediate family already knew that I was a non-believer, I was an atheist free thinker, but my other relatives did not, and the way I came out to them was they were of course it's a it's a family mailing list, and they would share all of these religious things. I just shared a, an article of Dan Barker, and that started the discussion that, that led to my actually coming out eventually. So you know, we, we are familiar with the scene, you know, the, the free thought secular scene um, in the in the U.S. And you know what's happening there? It's quite quite interesting, you know, right? Um, there are now several camps, I think. Like it's, uh, I think it's unfortunate that they can't all get along as well mm -hmm. as we do. Mm -hmm. in our we don't have our our schisms yet, you know. But but the issues that that caused the rift to happen, you know, very important issues of feminism mm -hmm. and and social justice and uh, and racism and all that. Those are important issues that even we have to tackle it in our organization. But we all came out, I think, for the better because of it. We're more aware, and there's always some room to grow. You know, at first it was just, you know, religion is wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, mm -hmm. religious influence in society when it meddles in politics, it's wrong, mm -hmm. right? But now there are. It, it We're more right. reflexive now. We we introspect because of these issues. We have to go back to the source of our beliefs yeah. and why we really believe these things. Yeah. And we have to discuss amongst ourselves yeah. and we have to talk about the differences in our beliefs because of course we have these beliefs and before the introspective period we used to rally yeah. under these common beliefs against um, a common opponent yeah. like the uh, Catholic Church and the lack of secularism in the Philippines or the the lack of the implementation of the secularism that should ideally exist in the Philippines. But we're going beyond that. Like yeah, we're not going to issues of you know minorities mm. being oppressed, mm. you know, of issues of privilege. And for some of us even um, animal rights. Mm. You know, I became a, a pescatarian and became and, a vegetarian. And I, I still think that even though I cannot practice it, veganism is the superior yeah. ethical ethical position. Yes. I, I do agree. Right. Even though I like cheese, I agree that <laughs> veganism is the, the superior. And and it's all because of the, the this group and mm. you know what what started in the it, with with the books of people like Sam Harris mm. and you know the those books it, it grew into this community and we're a lot more than that now. Mm. About uh, social political issues and but at the end of the day I think it's really about the, the basics of having a community, mm -hmm. you know, having uh, knowing that people are out there that think the way you do, that would accept you for for what you believe, and it's just a such a comfort for, mm -hmm. for that to, to happen because we have heard so many stories of people almost killing themselves mm -hmm. because they feel alone mm -hmm. and not understood. We're actually celebrating our. Fifth anniversary, like we did, we celebrated yesterday. It wasn't much of a celebration actually, when we just did the meetup as usual and at dinner after that. And I think the the lack of uh, fanfare. Uh, fanfare over this event is a good sign. Uh, I think people are already used to us mm. existing. Yeah. We are already used to us existing. We're like old people celebrating birthdays now, you know. <laughs> Uh, when, when it's so happy, when it's so... It's like dog years for us, the five years. Yeah. It's an old yeah. So we know that we're here to stay, and it's uh, it's really, it's still an uphill battle, mm -hmm. you know. But at least, unlike, unlike before we started, there are already people who are on the ground and fighting. And, yeah, and on that note, I think um, we're going to wrap up this, uh, this 
hangout. So this is the first time we've done it. Yeah. So you should do more of it. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the Filipino Freethinkers, just visit our website, uh, filipinofreethinkers.org. You can follow us on Twitter, twitter.com slash ffreethinkers. We're also on Facebook, facebook.com slash freethinkers. And I think that's enough for now. You can check out our YouTube channel as well for all of the videos. Podcasts. 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 Like this. Videos. Yeah. So much like this. And also we did conversations for our class where we yeah. interviewed people like uh, Richard Carrier and other um, free thought uh, celebrities um, in the in the US and, and uh, yeah, and all over the world. So thank you for for tuning in. Uh, please continue to to participate and watch this uh, ongoing free thought blogs conference. And uh, see you next time.